Hi. So next, I have the uh, pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, uh, Damon Centola. Uh, Jaakko, if I could still see my slide. Yes, it's right there. So uh, Damon Centola is a professor of communication, sociology and engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where he is also the director of the Network Dynamics Group. And he's also the author of the books, How Behavior Spreads and Change, How to Make Big Things Happen. Can really recommend both of those. And I still wanted to remind you uh, that if you at any point have any questions you would like to ask in the end, please write them down in the YouTube chat. That is the only way that we can see them. So yes, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, Damon. The digital stage is yours. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk today about kind of an expanding field of science that builds on a lot of the diffusion dynamics that um, I think most of you have seen in the first lecture. Um, and so I'm going to start with a little bit of a refresh and talk about the dynamics of networks and how contagion spread. And then I'm going to talk about sort of the new cutting edge science of how we're applying that to thinking about the capacity for human freedom and also what it means for our intelligence and our ability to make really good decisions. Um, so the sort of picture that you're familiar with from the kind of way we framed this, the way I framed this in the previous lecture was thinking about individuals connected to other individuals and the fact that that has a pattern to it um, and that we sort of select out certain features of that, of that pattern. So some people are more highly connected. They tend to be located in, in this way of thinking as more central. Um, and so when a person who's highly connected uh, is you know, activated, it seems, it seems as though that person has the capacity to influence a lot of other people. But one thing to notice is that when someone is highly connected, like this person shown in the center, we call them an influencer or you know a social star. They have lots of ties. But those ties also have a structure that's, that's sort of different than other kinds of networks. If you look in the periphery, this sort of cluster of networks on the right, those people, each individual has fewer ties, but also the ties are sort of connected to each other, these little, these little triangles, which means they're friends of friends, know one another. So it's not just that the, in, the influencer in the center has more ties, it's that he, has, uh, he or she has more weak ties going out in all directions. Um, whereas the people on the periphery have fewer ties, but those ties are clustered. And it's actually that difference between weak ties and, and clustered ties or long distance ties and short range ties that makes the difference for mobilization. And so this gives us kind of the classic intuition. When we think about what an influencer can do, what a highly connected person can do, we typically think, think of something like a virus, and that's the kind of classic model of simple contagion, which is you think of like the way a disease spreads. And we've um, sort of generalize that metaphor to thinking about any kind of technology or idea like a meme or a viral video and we have a very strong intuition that if this person here you know in the center of the network becomes activated that a, you know a contagion dynamic would spread from them sort of in a, in a very fast way all the way out to the network and the the point of the first lecture was to really highlight the fact that that is true and it works very well for simple contagions like viruses um, and, and viral videos but things change dramatically when we shift from simple contagions to complex contagions. Now remember, a complex contagion is anything that requires social reinforcement, anything there's risk or social doubt. Anytime the behavior change contradicts existing norms, then there's pushback. And the interesting thing is when there's pushback, it's not just that the simple contagion influencer strategy won't work as well. It's that oftentimes there's a backfire effect where by trying to initiate change with an influencer, you actually create more resistance to the change than there had been initially. So one of the examples I talk about in that case was something like Google Glass, where they you know, tried to use highly placed um, people in Silicon Valley to adopt this sort of wearable technology that was supposed to be cool and futuristic and sort of you know, cyborg-like, where people could you know, watch through their glasses, they could surveil the, you know, the visual environment, they could watch videos where they're talking to people, and also, of course, record. And there was such a strong emotional and cultural backlash to this that not only did the te glass technology not spread, but the people who would wear it, who used to be the social stars, actually were thought of as social pariahs. That there were signs in restaurants and cafes saying, you know, people who wear glass, not, not welcome. The term glass hole was invented as a critique of people who would wear it. So the people who were the social elite actually wound up becoming um, you know, the, the social dregs. They were sort of unwelcome. And so what that means when you're talking about complex contagions is when you look at all those green nodes, instead of looking at people who are like just susceptible, ready to get infected as you would with a disease, think of those people as people who already have beliefs, they already have norms. And if you're gonna push something toward them, it really matters how they respond. And so now when you try to push, in this case, the same population, I'm gonna use the influencer strategy, 
what winds up happening is that person may get one or two people to adopt, but everyone that they're connected to is going to push back and you get a lot of strong resistance and that resistance grows. And ultimately, as in the case of Google Glass, it actually not only stopped the technology from spreading, but Google shut down the entire product line. And you've noticed like for a decade, no one's been able to get wearables off the ground. I think Apple's trying again, but they're aware of how badly Google Glass failed. And so everyone's really sort of sensitive to the fact that there's a wrong way to do this. And what's interesting is if you take a complex contagions approach, which is you understand people need social reinforcement, you understand you're engaging social norms, not just spreading a disease. All of a sudden, you can take a same population, same level of resistance, and actually get a really good foothold on how to initiate change just by targeting a different part of the social network. And so what this shows here on the right-hand side is the same population, the same network, everyone has a high sort of normative resistance to the contagion. But instead of trying to go with the highly connected influencers, here you pick a couple people who are out in the periphery. Now these people, because they have fewer ties and ties are clustered, seem like they're not at all the places where you'd want to initiate a change campaign. But actually this is perfect for complex contagion because what you want with complex contagion is social support to grow reinforcement and confidence um, for the legitimacy and, credi uh, um, the credibility and legitimacy of this campaign. And so watch what happens as you start to initiate it, it doesn't spread out like a virus. You get this slow kind of local growth reinforcing through what we call wide bridges. And it spreads, instead of spreading the center, it actually grows through the periphery, through these sort of clustered, small um, uh, clustered network ties. And once it reaches a critical mass, then it flows through the rest of the population. And so the point is, when you're talking about anything that's a complex contagion or a social norm, the spreading dynamics are really different. And that tells you you can target different parts of the network. So that's what we learned so far. This is kind of what I covered in the first lecture about the ways in which the understanding of what kind of contagion you're trying to initiate, whether it's simple or complex, qualitatively changes your strategies for how to initiate a, a social change movement. Now, why do we get it wrong? And what is the real lesson here? The real lesson here is that when we look at networks, we have certain cognitive biases. We have certain predispositions that, that actually lead us to get it wrong. There's a kind of folk wisdom, which is when you look at the network on the left, it just looks fast. It looks like, okay, get that person in the center activated and things will spread in all directions. But what you're not appreciating is all those ties that person has are also social constraints. That person is being watched and evaluated and thought about. And if the person in the center does something that's really deviant or different from the group, then there's a lot of pressure pushing back on that person, which is why people who are highly connected don't tend to lead social change when that social change is complex or difficult or challenges existing norms. The network on the right seems like it's more, you know, there's, there's less access to the world. People are clustered in triangles. But if you get a small critical mass within this group on the right, this kind of network is actually the better place to initiate change. You can grow a critical mass very effectively with only a few adopters, and they can reinforce each other and it can spread to the network. So now we've learned a really big lesson about how our intuitions lead us in the wrong way. We see the network on the left, it looks fast, but that's only for simple contagions and viruses. For complex contagions, the network on the right is better. So now I wanna take all of that, which is what was discussed in the first lecture, and I want to talk about what that means for a brand new problem we haven't thought about, because all we've talked about so far is how social change and contagion spread. But what we haven't thought about is sort of what that means for us and our lives and our ability to sort of be more effective citizens, to be free members of society, and ultimately to be more intelligent members of society, to make better decisions within our organizations, within our communities, and within our nations. How do these features of network structure and the influences around us affect our intelligence and our capacity to be you know, free and capable people. And what I wanna say, the sort of interesting punchline is that the lessons I just reviewed about simple and complex contagion generalize to the question of intelligence. Where when you look at the network on the left, the per person in the center looks like they have a tremendous amount of power, they have ties going in every direction. You say, well, that person's pretty free. They can influence a lot of things and they can make decisions based on all the information they gather. And again, I wanna say, there's a really strong sort of intuitive error we make. The network on the right where people are constrained in these little clusters looks like people are, are less free, but it also doesn't give us any insight about intelligence. I want to say that the network on the right is a network that will actually make people more intelligent and make the decisions better. And I'm going to walk you through this now. So I'm going to talk about this notion of intelligence and freedom, the reasons when we fail, when we make bad decisions, why that is, and how the structures, the networks we're embedded in actually make us freer and smarter. And what this means when we think about things like social engineering and the way people are using nudges and incentives and so forth to try to encourage people to make good decisions or smart decisions. So I'm going to talk very briefly about what I call the wisdom of the crowds and this notion of structural intelligence. I'm going to talk about 
an experiment we recently ran in which you're going to see some sort of striking results and how we can take people on social media where they're completely immersed in a universe of misinformation and disinformation and how by structuring their interactions on in these web communities you can actually demonstrably increase their ability to sort of understand hard problems which i think without this kind of science would have seemed impossible and i'll talk about the implications for how we build public policies and do social engineering so just a quick briefer on like what the wisdom of the crowds is. So there's this idea that's been around. Um, it, it's been around since you know Gauss. Um, you know, but really it was this British um, biologist slash statistician uh, Francis Galton who had this idea. He said, look, if you take a bunch of people and they're all making an estimate, let's say the true answer is what's the likelihood of that you know a bunch of physicians are taking an estimate of a patient. They look at the patient, do an exam. What's likely that this patient has melanoma? Well, the true answer may be 60%, okay? But if you take a bunch of clinicians here, this is the clinician shown as, as a bunch of individuals taking estimates, and you lay out their estimate distribution, um, you can say, well, how, you know, how close was each clinician to the right answer? You could say, well, on average, clinicians were off by about 20 points. Some guessed over, some guessed under, under but there's a sort of average level of individual error. Now, the, the, the genius of the wisdom of the crowd was to say, well, sure, there's average individual error. You know, you guess 20 below, I guess 20 above. So we each have an error of 20. But if you combine all of the errors, then someone who guessed 20 below and someone who guessed 20 above, actually on average, that plus 20 and minus 20 equals zero. So if you add up people's errors, then all of a sudden the group average is actually much better than the individual average. And that's sort of this notion of the wisdom of the crowd. And that's been around for a century. And scientists still, in, in 2024, scientists are still using this argument about the wisdom of the crowd being a good way to solve problems about climate change and global crises and understanding. So um, all kinds of sort of hard to think about things like stock prices. Can we use the wisdom of the crowd, aggregate a bunch of people's you know, independent decisions, and come up with some group average that's smarter than the individuals? It's true mathematically that this works, but there's a big problem. And the problem is social influence. So when people start to talk to each other, all of a sudden their independent estimates, which one person would have guessed 20 below, one person guessed 20 below. So, you know, plus 20 and minus 20 equals zero. So now you go from each person having some error to every, the group having no error. What happens when people talk to each other is that people start to get influenced by their peers. So now instead of it being plus 20 and minus 20, well, now it's, now it's sort of plus 20 and plus five. Everyone starts to get pushed in the same direction. And so someone who's, you know, a little bit more influential can pull the population, everyone, in the same direction. And when this winds up happening, this means the error of the group, the entire distribution of estimates shifts. They're no longer independent. And now what you get is an increase in error. And so once there's sort of this kind of social influence process, not only do individuals get worse, but actually this whole sort of beautiful wisdom of the crowd idea that, you know, on average, we get the right answer, that actually disappears too. On average, actually, the group is much worse than individuals were at the beginning. So there's been this literature for the last 30 or 40 years, arguing very, very compellingly. And a you know, popular book by Sir Wiki was called The Wisdom of the Crowds. He makes this argument. And a lot of papers were published you know, in top journals making this argument. That if you let people interact in social networks, it really undermines the wisdom of the crowd. So this is where um, all of my work and the research that my team does has picked up. And the, the key question we've asked, and this will build naturally on, on the th topics you've just seen, is to say this. Well, certainly social influence can lead the crowd astray and make the group average worse if you, know, you have someone who's very charismatic leading everyone in the, long, in the wrong direction. But what you've ignored or what the sort of literature has overlooked is that social influence isn't just sort of free floating and vague, it always happens within social networks. So what happens if we change the network structure of social influence? How does that change this process. Certainly there can be some situations where the sort of social persuasion or social influence can undermine the wisdom of the crowd. But, and this is the big question, are there other situations in which by changing the structure of the network, when people learn from each other, it can actually improve the wisdom of the crowds, making it even smarter than it would have been just by taking their independent judgments. And this is something that for the last century it hasn't occurred to anybody that the wisdom of the crowds is actually a fairly low baseline for human performance, and we can do much better. So what we did is we looked at the sort of structure of different networks. And the key thing here is centralization. What's to say, how much power does each person have in the network? 
that winds up being the most important thing in understanding the wisdom of the crowds and collective intelligence. On the left-hand side, you see a network that's called egalitarian. What it means is that everyone has the same number of ties. And this is basically a random network, but everyone has connect four connections. So because everyone has the same number of ties, there's not really a center to the network. There's just a lot of equality and um, there's no power differential between one person and another. But as you can see, as you move to the right on the scale, a, a fewer and fewer people have more and more connections to the far right, which is a highly centralized network where one person has the vast majority of connections. And as you can imagine, that person then has disproportionate influence over the flow of information. And the question was by changing the sort of structure of peer learning in this way, would this directly affect everyone's capacity to make intelligent decisions? Now at the outset, you've got the same people answering the same question. So it's not really clear why changing the network would make that much of a difference because everyone's just talking to their strangers and strangers don't have special information. So why would the network make such a difference? Well, the first thing we found is that it does. If you make networks highly centralized in this way, um, then the person in the center really can push the wisdom of the crowd in the right or wrong direction. And more often than not, the person in the center, even if they're really accurate on one top, we can imagine um, a very senior chief surgeon who might be more accurate on melanoma diagnosis, making a really good decision and influencing their peers and influencing the collective intelligence. But then if you keep asking that person more and more questions, they still tend to stay centralized. And that's a position of power, they don't give it up. And so when you move to different kinds of questions, we're now we're talking about you know, ED um, ad admittees with a broken bone or other people with like chronic you know, inflammatory diseases like asthma, that person will still maintain a set uh, position of centrality, but their expertise will be different. And if you iterate over enough questions, what you tend to see is that networks that are highly centralized on average tend to actually reduce the equality of performance and the intelligence of the collective. That's interesting because a lot of organizations, hospitals and, and um, research firms and you know, finance groups tend to be highly centralized, even, even scientific research teams. And as a result of that, you tend to see that the performance of these groups is actually far lower than it could be. And so this is, goes in the sort of spirit of persuasion bias and how social influence can undermine the wisdom of the crowd. But now here's the big question. Is there a way in which changing the network, leaving every person the same, not changing their individual intelligence, but just changing how they talk to each other? By changing the flow of information between them, could you turn this on its head and actually make the social persuasion part of the sort of interaction actually beneficial for intelligence? And so here, this is where we looked at the completely egalitarian network, letting people talk to each other and share information freely. So now in this case, people who are lower on the status hierarchy, lower on the totem pole, now have equal influence. This, this creates a much greater diversity of voices and a, a diversity of voices across you know, demographics, across gender, across race, but also across things like training and things like level of experience. And what's interesting is sometimes the people with the least experience have ideas that no one's thought of. And because it's egalitarian, now everyone has this sort of influence. So rare ideas or unusual um, ways of thinking can now have influence on how people are thinking about a problem. And the most compelling finding is that that can dramatically improve the intelligence of the whole. Everyone gets smarter by virtue of a structure that increases the influence of diversity. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about one of these studies, but just to give you some reference, over the last uh, five years, we've published a number of these in the proceedings of the National Academy and in Nature, where we've sort of looked at economic beliefs, Democrats and Republicans talking about climate change, about immigration, We've looked at physicians, looking at medical errors and implicit racial and gender bias in physicians. And in every single one of these studies, we've consistently found that moving populations from centralized networks to these egalitarian networks consistently improves the collective intelligence of these. And that's, again, just from regular Democrats and Republicans debating climate change to like professional clinicians evaluating real patient cases. So it's this broad sweeping implication that the networks control the intelligence of populations. So I wanna talk just briefly about something that we all think about today, which is, okay, sure, if you're gonna connect people differently, maybe there's ways in which connecting them could improve their intelligence. But that's not really the problem that we have to worry about. Because today in everyday life, in business life, but also online everywhere, it's not just that people are uncertain or uninformed, it's that there are people who are actively trying to dissuade people from finding the truth. There are disinformation agents 
who are pumping this information to the population. So when you introduce that into these networks, is there any hope at all of achieving any kind of collective intelligence? So that's the question we answered. Now there's an there's a intuition that's been out there for a couple of years that the reason why social media has been so susceptible to misinformation and disinformation on things like vaccination and other public health issues is that people who have similar beliefs, people who are resistant, let's say, to public health information, all kind of clump together. They all attach to each other. On social media, we call this homophily, but basically they all sort of interact with one another. And that creates kind of insulation against sort of truth or information about um, vaccination safety and other things. And I want to argue that that whole hypothesis, although it's intuitively compelling, that the reason why we see so much misunderstanding of real public health threats and of real um, changes in the world also with regard to climate change, it's actually not due to homophily. People bonding with people like them really isn't the problem. The problem is these networks of people bonding to people tend to be highly centralized. And it's really the centralization of those networks and not the fact that people are similar to each other that's causing this sort of degradation of the group intelligence. Now that's a really contentious hypothesis because it's very intuitive to say the reason collective intelligence suffers is because of you know everyone with the same wrong belief only talking to each other in these echo chambers. I think echo chambers is a real is a is just a complete red herring. That really what's going on is that you can take those same people who are all similar in echo chamber, and if you make that echo chamber less centralized, actually people will learn and get smarter. So it's really the network structure that's doing the work here. But it's one thing to say it; it's another thing to show it. So I built an experiment to test this specific hypothesis. My prediction was if you put people together who actually you know, resist vaccination and put them into homophilous groups, change those groups to make some of them egalitarian and some of them more centralized, you'll see really big differences in what those people ultimately believe just by virtue of changing the centralization of the groups. The experiment was we, we got about um, 1,000 people. And this is important. They were only paid for getting the answer right. So people weren't paid for showing up. They weren't even paid for completing the study. They were just paid for doing a good job. So everyone had those same incentives to actually care about doing, you know, doing it well. Um, people were pinged on an app and then people were randomized. And this will make sense given what I've just described. There's homophilus populations in the US. There's a lot of resistance among African-Americans to vaccination. So these were African-Americans who were unvaccinated. And we put them either into a centralized network with one person in the middle or an egalitarian network, whatever, an equal connectivity. And just to control for the population, we also did the same thing with diverse populations. So all vaccination levels, all races mixed together, again, either centralized or egalitarian. Um, and in the center of each network, um, you can see this red node. The red node was a disinformation agent who actively, um, every single interaction of, um, with the, their peers, they actively promoted false information. They were aggressively saying falsehoods. So this is real social media. We have someone um, trying to convince everyone of the wrong answer. And so now the question is clearly the centralized network should get worse. We should, if this, if this social media environment we've built is real, we really should see the worsening of beliefs just like we do on social media. The question is when we move people over to egalitarian networks, even with that disinformation agent, what happens? Does it just kind of slow down? that sort of worsening of intelligence or does something else happen? Well, so let's see. So um, we ran this for three rounds and the agent, the disinformation agent pumps in really in incorrect information. So we asked about how um, bad is the vaccine? Are there lots of you know, severe reactions, which is anaphylaxis to getting vaccinated? And that's the, the big concern everyone has is that the vaccine is dangerous. So the correct answer is out of 10,000 patients, about 35 have a bad reaction. But our disinformation agent said 8,000 out of 10,000 and kept saying that. And so everyone in the network saw that sort of outrageous number and then used that possibly to evaluate their thinking. So people would see they get the opportunity to evaluate the question independently without any social influence. On the second round, they'd have a chat with other people in the network, talk about it in a very freeform way. We also got to look at people's sort of emotion, the way they thought about it, what they felt about it. And then they would get a second round in which they could reevaluate the question, but now they could see the answers given by their peers in the social network. And then they would chat again a second time, and then they get a third round where they could see their peers sort of updated answers and then either ignore that information or use it. And the final round, they'd give a final response, and that would be the one that we would use to evaluate their performance. So in essence, we ran this entire experiment eight times. So each trial of the experiment had you know, the centralized networks that were either you know, diverse populations or the homophilous unvaccinated African-Americans. 
or there are egalitarian networks with diverse homophiles. So this trial had four independent networks, and we replicated that eight times. So that's 958 subjects, but actually only 32 data points because we treat each network as its own independent observation. And our question is, on, on, on average, does the intelligence of the network increase or decrease as a result of interacting with these different structures? So what you see is that in the centralized networks, I think as expected because the influence of the central actor, people get much worse. As collective intelligence goes down, people believe that vaccines are more dangerous and after three rounds, they're much, more, they're much less likely to get vaccinated. That's what we'd expect. Now the question is, you've got the same disinformation agent in the egalitarian networks, would that just slow down or slightly reduce the effect of this disinformation? What actually happened is the egalitarian networks reversed the effect completely eliminating the disinformation agent. And actually people got smarter. People in those networks started off with some bias against the vaccine. And by the end of their deliberations, they actually were much more accurate in their beliefs about vaccine safety, even though there was a different disinformation agent. And then we break this down from my homophily, it's even more interesting. Because in the, in the diverse networks, okay, the centralized agent made things worse. The egalitarian networks made things better, but there's not a significant difference. In the homophilous networks, things actually got a little bit more significantly worse, which is kind of what people have been complaining about, that homophily on social media does increase hysteria about vaccines and lower intelligence. And that's true. People's error increased more in homophilous networks. But if you change the network structure to egalitarian, all of a sudden, the homophilous groups with the people who are like each other, all unvaccinated, all with fears about vaccines, those groups actually became the most intelligent. They had the greatest improvement and collective intelligence just by virtue of talking to each other. Remember, there's no moderator, there's no public health actor. The only person in these networks is a disinformation agent saying vaccines are dangerous. Nevertheless, the, the sort of egalitarian structure made these homophilous populations much more capable of learning and thinking together and actually arriving at the right answer. Um, one of the most interesting things when you look at the sort of the chat and what people said, there's some expletives in here. I apologize for that is that the actual conversation was exactly what you expect, the sort of free flow conversation. But the tone of the conversation, in terms of how aggressive it was, how many expletives people used, how friendly they were, actually was different from structure to structure, where the centralized networks actually had more aggressive, kind of angrier conversations, and everyone became less accurate. And the egalitarian networks, those people actually had friendlier, more interesting informational conversations, and people became more accurate. So the structure of the network here, which seems like something that really shouldn't matter because the people are the same people, it actually qualitatively changed how they felt and their sort of emotional experience of civility, and that translated into a much more accurate understanding of the outcomes. And so the sort of implications here are that network structure and centralization actually reduced intelligence and increased anger, while egalitarian structures improved intelligence and actually increased civility. The solution here is when we're thinking about populations who are under threat, right? Like we think of as vulnerable populations like minorities in the US, who are under constant attack in many different ways. And those populations will tend to centralize. That's sort of a natural structural adaptation. That really is a big problem for their ability to sort of internalize new information and make smart collective decisions. But I want to emphasize that everyone's attributed to, to homophily. And you know, in observational data, you know, the structure of the network and the composition of the network, homophily, centralization, all this stuff is combined in a very messy way in, you know, observational online data. You can't disentangle them. But in an experimental strategy like this, you can actually tear apart homophily from centralization and show that homophily by itself actually only amplifies the network. So the network centralized, then homophily will make it much worse. But if the, the, the network is egalitarian, then homophily will actually improve the collective learning intelligence of the population. And this is important because a lot of the work that we do in data science today is looking for like large scale correlations and we're trying to sort of infer causation without any real sense of what the mechanism is. One of the real benefits of this kind of science is that once we identify the mechanism, we can say for certain, although homophily is correlated with centralization in online networks, homophily isn't the mechanism. It's actually centralization by itself is the mechanism. And we can show that with diverse populations and homophilus populations. So by doing that, it gives us real causal control over the kinds of recommendations we would make, some, make in a policy setting. So with that, I'll close. This is the book that was just mentioned, um, and I'm happy to take your questions.
this really interesting keynote. Uh, I'm just checking to make sure if you still have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, I can take, yeah, I can stand for a few questions. Okay, good. So, Anna, you have been following the chat. Yes. So, what do we have? Well, the first question is, um, what kind of support do uh, egalitarian networks need um, for them to become more common and stronger in business and public sector? So uh, that's a great question, and this has to, I would say there's different contexts. So if you're talking, for example, some of the work I do is with physicians in hospitals. In that case, hospitals tend to be highly centralized because of the training strategies where the more senior people give advice to more junior people. So centralization happens by virtue of the fact that all the, all the sort of, you know, residents and, and um, interns look to the more senior people for advice when they're uncertain about what to do. So one way you can make networks less centralized is actually by creating either using these kinds of like you know cell phone technologies like apps or just creating informal sessions you can actually allow for more peer communication across the intern groups and across the resident groups where they could learn from one another instead of always learning from that central person now that's in a medical setting of course you can imagine a similar thing in like a corporate setting where you can say who's the most senior level uh, manager that's the person everyone kind of looks to for advice you could actually decentralize that a bit by saying, we're going to start having meetings where the more senior people aren't even present in the room. And so this will force people at different levels to talk to one another and have sort of a much more integrated egalitarian network. Online, it's actually even easier because our online networks are actually built by um, a company, right? The people we have access to, the people we see, these are things that the organization has control over. They recommend people to us and we attach to them. These recommendation systems are built, and everyone's kind of familiar with the Facebook files and the fact that, you know, about 10,000 documents were leaked from Facebook. And the interesting thing about the leaked documents is that they show really clearly that what Facebook was doing was promoting the influencers, which led more people to attach to influencers, which led the influencers to become even bigger. And as a result of that, you saw increased anger, increased um, disagreement, and decreased collective intelligence when it came to things like voting and vaccines. And so... It really was the, the sort of algorithmic decision making by the company that generated the sort of pattern of centralization. So that's actually easy to fix. The company just makes different decisions about who gets recommended to you and who sees whom. And you can very easily, within a period of like 60 to 70 hours, change the structure of social media just by altering the recommendations. And very quickly, people who are highly connected will become much less prevalent. And you can, I think, would see within like a period of two, three months really different qual qualitative changes in the conversations people were having. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I've um, got another question here. Um, in what ways do you think artificial intelligence is likely to influence behavior change? What difference so right does now, it make? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the question right now is to what extent are people aware that they're interacting with AI? Um, the studies actually in this book change, I discuss a couple of those studies where people build um, what are called botnets. So instead of thinking of a intelligence agent, which we all do now kind of like chat GPT, it kind of sits there and responds to us one-on-one. -on -one. Think of collective intelligence as like a distributed network of bots. And they're talking to us, but they're also talking to each other, which is interesting because your, your question is, well, why would bots talk to each other? Well, because in a lot of these interactions, humans are like third parties. You're, it's, like, it's like if you two were to start talking to each other and I would just kind of observe it, then I'm learning something about how people talk to each other, about what you say and what the other person responds. And that's actually teaching me something about norms, teaching me something about the facts in the world, and also about emotions, like what, what are the sort of reactions people are having to each other? Well, now that's happening a lot on social media with bots, where people are watching people talk to each other who aren't actually people. It's actually bots talking to bots and people are drawing inferences about what topics are valid, what kinds of conversational norms exist, what kinds of civility is appropriate. And so I think that's where bots really come in is acting as these kinds of um, arbiters or safeguards of like what the actual uh, norms are on social media. And so I think that's interesting, but obviously really risky because if the bots decide to be like really uncivil and engage in like really sort of unproductive conversations, even if the people aren't engaged in that, that can still teach them that this is sort of the way people interact on social media. 
And so there's this kind of, it's almost like with um, the evolution of viruses and the evolution of vaccines. There's like a, um, an arms race that as, anti, as sort of antibiotics get better, then you know, bacteria evolve to become more sophisticated and we develop you know, better antibiotics. But everyone's concerned there's gonna be this sort of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Well, it's sort of like that, where there's like bots that get more sophisticated and then a lot of computer scientists do their PhDs developing ways of detecting bots. But of course, that just means the people who build bots get more sophisticated. And so there is this question of like, to what extent do we know or will we ever know what the full population of these sort of artificial agents is. And that's, a, I think that question will then tell us a lot about how much the interactions and the behaviors of those actors will really affect what we humans believe about what the sort of governing intelligence is online. Thank you. Do we still have time for one more question? How, how are you set for time, Damon? Oh, uh, we can do what, yes, we can do one more question. One more question. Okay, so you presented where your research group is at and the kind of uh, challenges you've been uh, resolving. Kind of what's next for behavioral science and behavioral science research? Any new, uh, really hot emerging topics that you or other people around the world are, are starting to tackle? Yeah, I mean, that was the theme of this talk. This, the theme of this talk was what are the new cutting edge things? And collective intelligence is like the hot new thing. That's where there's a lot of work that's coming out, but it's not very well known. It's coming out and some of it's coming out in big journals, like I showed you in the proceedings of the National Academy um, and in Nature, but a lot of it's coming out in like smaller technical journals or journals that are just dedicated to collective intelligence. But this is the, the idea that connectivity doesn't just affect diffusion, but that we can start to think about diffusion and spreading as something that actually really impacts, not just you know behavior, whatever that is, but that the behavior can be judged as like either more intelligent or less intelligent and that's a huge part of our science is determining which structures affect the intelligence of our behavior. So this is actually the next book I'm writing, which should be coming out in about a year and a half, is all about this topic of like what the future of collective intelligence looks like. And I, this is the, yes, this is the big, exciting new area for sure. Lovely, thank you. We'll be watching out for, for, for your research and for your book as it, as it uh, progresses. Thank you so much. Absolutely, my pleasure. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>